Hi, I'm Dennis Cheek, visiting professor at the Asia Center for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy here at the National University of Singapore Business School. As part of our Conversations in Philanthropy series, I'm here today with my guest, Paul Brest, who is the current president of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation in California in the United States, one of the largest foundations in the United States and one of the largest certainly in the world as well in the private foundation sector. He's the former uh, dean of the Stanford Law School and a emeritus professor of law at the Stanford Law School, as well as an emeritus professor in the master's program in public policy at Stanford University, where he continues to teach a course on judgment and decision making. He's authored many, many articles, given many thought pieces, and also been a keynote speaker at many conferences. He's very familiar with philanthropic efforts across the United States and globally as well. So we're delighted to have you with us today for this conversation. And maybe you could begin by just chatting with our viewers and telling us a little bit about the Hewlett Foundation, which you've been leading since the year 2000, what it does, uh, some of its impact during the time that you've been there, and maybe just a tiny bit about its history as well. The Hewlett Foundation was started with the personal wealth of Bill Hewlett from Hewlett Packard. It's not, it's not connected with the company in any way, and it's now grown to be I think the sixth or seventh largest foundation in, in the U.S. And we're a grant-making foundation. That is, we, we don't do operations ourselves. Rather, we look for organizations in the areas of our interest, and we then make grants to support them. And all of our money comes from the endowment, which is now about $7 billion, which started with Bill Hewlett's wealth. And our major areas of work are the um, Western environment in the U.S. and climate change globally, global development and population, which our work focuses mainly in India and Africa, and education in the Bay Area, and we also do some, some grant making in philanthropy, and we also support performing arts in the Bay Area. I think there's been a lot of interest in Asia recently about the work of larger foundations. And I know many times here in Asia, some people have told me that they sort of find it very difficult to sort of penetrate that veil uh, with foundations, particularly larger foundations, in terms of understanding really how they go about making their decisions. And I'm wondering if you could maybe just lift the curtain a little bit for us today and tell us a little bit about how you actually go about making grant making decisions within the foundation. We try to be pretty transparent about this and increasingly uh, putting as much information as we can about our goals and strategies on our website. Uh, but let me, let me kind of give you the process. The, the goals in the very broader sense, that is our interest in energy and climate or um, performing arts, are goals that our board of directors determine. And Bill Hewlett himself had no specifications for what the foundation mm -hmm. should do. But a number of the areas we pursue are ones that, that he and his wife, Flora, were interested in from the beginning. And it's the program staff and I who ultimately come to the board with ideas for particular strategies. For example, in the area of education, domestic education, we are trying to develop a curriculum that brings critical thinking and problem-solving skills, something that Singapore is quite strong on. We're trying to bring it into the classroom of mm -hmm. public schools. And we went through a strategic planning process and then brought a proposal to the board, which after some discussion and some changes, is now the strategy we're implementing for an eight to 10 year period. So when you think about your grant making, you know, do you think of some projects that really are running like that a decade long and then there are others that are much shorter in duration? The grants we make are in pursuance of particular goals, that is, to take, to take another example, we are, together with some other foundations, committed to trying to reduce the rate of global warming, to reduce the rate of CO2 emissions to uh, reduce global warming. And that's, that's a strategy which you don't think you're going to do or succeed in doing yeah. in a, a short period of time. We've made the single largest set of grants in our history to an organization, and it's a five-year grant which is quite likely to be renewed if the organization remains successful in its, in its work. So in climate, and I think that's true of much of our population and development work, uh, we're talking about 10 or 20 year time horizons. I know you've been a person of interest, I suppose, within the philanthropic world because many times you have gone to major conferences and you've sort of held up a mirror to the American philanthropic community 
in regards to some of the activities and actions that foundations take and their role within society. And you've particularly been pretty well known about making fairly public and transparent some of the failures that there have been uh, in philanthropy. And in your own foundation, I know you have these sort of annual internal competitions as to which team can really present really the best anatomy of a case of failure in terms of right. something that was actually executed within the foundation. Much of the philanthropy we do is risk taking. The results are by no means assured. And if one's going to draw a distinction between pure charity at the one side and strategic philanthropy on the other, although I don't think it's a sharp distinction, if you're doing mm -hmm. pure charity, it's, you're likely to have fewer failures. If you're trying to feed or shelter the homeless, you, you still have to make sure the organizations you're working with are successful, but uh, at that point, things, you're very likely, every dollar is likely to produce, mm. feed a hungry mouth. If you're doing work on policy advocacy, trying to change national policies on CO2 emissions or mm. improve education, that's risky work. That means that the probability of success is by no means assured. And when you're in the domain of risks, then you are much more likely to learn from failures as well as successes. If, you're, if, you're, if you actually are engaged in risky strategies and don't have any failures, then you're fooling yourself. Mm. So the premise is we, we, we love to learn from successes, but we also think we can learn a great deal from either organizational or strategic failures on our part. And that's the rationale for, for our spending quite a lot of time, mainly internally because we don't, we don't need to criticize others, but mainly internally, uh, seeing where, where we fail as much as where we succeed for one reason only, which is to become better at what we do. So there's a uh, sense in which really what you're saying is if you don't fail, then probably you're not being ambitious enough in what you're really trying to accomplish. I think that's a very, very good way of putting it. Our office is on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park, and across the street are the major venture capitalists in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if any one of them said that all of their investments succeeded, uh, you just wouldn't believe them. Yeah. And we're sort of a venture capitalist on the philanthropic side. As you think about American philanthropy and the history of philanthropy in America, how would you describe really what the role is or the relationship really between foundations and the foundation sector, and then the government and the for-profit sector, and then of course the nonprofit sector, and then finally there's of course the sort of third estate, the media, right. who reports about all these different sectors all the time. Uh, how do you really see the foundation world as really relating to those other worlds in the United States? Well, let me start with the nonprofit sector. Because we are a grant-making foundation, the real work is done by the nonprofit sector. We're, we're in effect the, the investors who look for nonprofit organizations that are doing good work to achieve the goals that our board, our board sets, as I mentioned before. So they do the heavy lifting. We, we invest in them, not financially, but we're in fact social investors. Uh, we work together with governments uh, that are seeking similar goals. And for example, in India and Africa, uh, some of our grant making to improve education and, trans and, and population and on other development issues is done in collaboration with government. But we also work with government in a different way. We are, we are advocates and we're often trying to improve government policies. Mm. So in, in the US, uh, we work in the climate area to advocate for government policies that will uh, increase energy efficiency, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. With the for-profit sector, uh, especially in an area that you're very familiar with, which is open education resources, uh, we see ourselves often providing the seed intellectual work for work that we hope will be taken over by, by the for-profit mm -hmm. sector. In some ways, it's the success of some of the work we do is that, that it doesn't need to be supported by philanthropy forever. Mm -hmm. So we, we work with, with with any sector that will be an ally in achieving our goals. As you think about Asia, and of course your foundation's been active really in parts of Asia right. for a period of, quite a period of time really, and you personally have visited much of Asia over, over the years. Uh, as you think about sort of lessons, if you were to sort of start in Asia and you were launching a reasonable sized foundation, 
and you were looking towards the experience in America, what do you think are the real lessons that, both positive or negative, that a philanthropist in Asia could actually learn from the American experience? The major advice I would give to any new foundation or a um, family that was significantly interested in philanthropy is choose goals, choose goals that are ambitious but are realizable, and goals where you can measure your success and then measure your success in terms of success or failure. Look as often as you can at how you're doing, and if you are not on track in the way you hope, see why you're not on track and do what you can to change the strategy or change what you're doing in order to move towards success. One final question related to that. I mean, I know a lot of the success of Hewlett really has hinged upon these various partnerships that you've built. And sometimes foundations have a tendency around the world, really, to act as, you know, Unitarian sort of movers or see themselves as sort of the prime mover in many instances, often with issues that really go well beyond probably their capacity to even deal with. Um, what's your thoughts in terms of how you actually structure those kind of partnerships because many of your partnerships run across terms of administration. Right. You have new leaders coming and going. You have new policies being promulgated. To begin with, you need to have common goals. There's no point in being a partner mm -hmm. with an organization that is not interested in the same issues you are. But even when you have common goals, there needs to be a willingness on the part of all the partners to give a little bit, not to have to do everything your way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's ultimately in the same way that business partnerships are built. It depends a great deal on trust. Um, you can sometimes build on a tradition of trust of your predecessors, but then you have to maintain it with your counterparts at the other foundations right now. Mm -hmm. And that also requires a degree of transparency on everybody's part. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. We appreciate you spending some time with us today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.